Thank you for joining us for this episode today. We're joined by Dr. Sheila Morrison, and we're going to be speaking about talking to pediatricians, teachers, and ophthalmologists about myopia management. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sheila Morrison. We're so excited to hang out with you. It's been uh, since you were an intern here, and then I've seen you at a couple optometry meetings, but I miss hanging out with you, my friend. I know. These are always a good opportunity to see your friends. It's hard yes. to get together these days all the time as much as we would like. I know. I had to start a podcast so my friends would hang out with me again. It's the only way you can get friends. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, uh, we were just chatting a little bit about some things that are happening in our practices. And uh, uh, Sheila was sharing with me a little bit about um, some things they're dealing with. And it's a concept of, around safety that you know a lot of parents ask about it, right? A lot of parents are curious about this. Um, I have a, an incredible relationship here in the Seattle area with a pediatric ophthalmologist who is an advocate for orthokeratology, but by and large, that may not be as popular. Orthokeratology seems to be something that we do less of in the ophthalmology space, where in the, uh, atropine has historically been something we do less of in the optometry space. So we kind of see those silos. And so, Sheila, you were kind of sharing with me this, this, the safety concerns. And what are some things you guys are working on to help bring safety uh, to the forefront of this conversation? Well, the number one thing that we started doing was uh, a focus on education. And this comes before what we have to do with our patients when it comes to good relationships with our ophthalmology partners and not only just vision care, Dave, but you know, there's others involved too. So we have in Canada, there's pediatricians, there's pediatric ophthalmologists, there's um, other health providers and everybody uh, needs to be on the same page, you know, when we're dealing with uh, the best outcomes for these kids. And one of the things that we did face, you know, early on, as you know, is uh, there's always a question when it comes to some of our partners that don't necessarily have the same training that we do in medical contact lens or orthokeratology specifically. So um, one of our initiatives here um, at our practice, after I arrived in the volume started amping up and we started getting, you know, sometimes our parents would bring messages from their ophthalmologists that had, they would go see, come see us and be all excited about ortho -K, go talk to their ophthalmologist and come back asking if maybe, you know, are, are we sure that there's no safety concerns? And so we started off with education. So sending, you know, current papers to all the doctors that are working with these kids just to really get everybody up to speed. I think sometimes some of the data and some of the um, evidence that um, other health providers have historically seen have been, you know, um, older in my experiences. There's a lot of case reports from, you know, in the earlier 2000s highlighting complications with kids in contacts. And it's actually a really important evolution because what it's created is um, definitely a point where I am and where our practice is in not minimizing the risks. And so probably the very first thing is to acknowledge what the risks are with any medical device that we're using. And when we're talking with these um, other providers is provide, giving them the resources to get up to date to start. So to make sure that they have all the current, you know, those large studies that we have available to us, uh, looking at tons of different literature, putting it all together in these reviews to show what the actual reality is. Because in reality, the complication um, incidents in contact lens patients and children when the devices are used as directed is actually very low. And so that's been the first thing is to really share those resources with those that maybe have questions, just to demonstrate that what we're doing is not our own personal, my, it's not Sheila's idea to go and put this device on this child or this patient there's a vast, broad kind of uh, number of resources over many, many years demonstrating safety. So that's the first start place we started, educating ourselves, our partners with evidence base, so that ophthalmology yeah. can start to learn kind of what's out there um, beyond those older case reports. 
Yeah, you know, I think that's a, a real key component, and you know, particularly where orthokeratology was in the 70s and 80s, and that's kind of where orthokeratology first entered into the medical school, school education, and ophthalmology would take care of a lot of those medical problems that was happening when an optometrist was fitting somebody back in those days. And so that, that history fed into the educational process that happened. And, you know, once you kind of realize that and you're like, well, they should get over it. It's a lot better. Now we think about some things that we were taught in an optometry space, for instance, about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, right? They cause corneal melt right? We were taught that. And so like, we may want to use them with caution. Well, that was like one case report in one study that it showed that, but yet we grab onto that, that it could cause that or retinal detachments with pilocarpine. And the, the actual studies that show that is so small, but because it was a side effect, it's taught in schools, it's part of boards. And that's how they have perceived the safety with orthokeratology is based upon something that happened you know, decades and decades ago. So it, it is imperative to bring them up to speed with, uh, with education. So Sheila, how do you go about doing that? Do you actually send them copies of, of, of papers? Do you like just print it out and like put it in an envelope and be like, here, this goes to show you, or what, what do you do? So links actually usually so over electronic, you know, where we have sent a variety oh, of articles. I actually, know you had the internet in Canada. Canadians have really picked up their game, Dave. Just, <laughs> You're half Canadian, though. I thought so. You should know. I, these things. I know. I do. <laughs> we. It's so. It's funny that this is. You know. Um. I actually had the exact this exactly what we're talking about happened this week. And it's, you know, an ophthalmologist that I respect greatly. We have a lot of patients that we share. He refers all the time from medical lenses to me every so often though, it started a couple of years ago when I got back, I still, you know, would get the odd parent that would have questions. And I remember sending him articles two years ago. And this week he, I had another family that came to me and they came for ortho K, but they said, look, I just had a conversation with our ophthalmologist he strongly advised against it. I'm like, seriously, I thought I had done due diligence with you already. So there's two parts of how I personally approach it. And one is to try to understand where they're coming from first, before I react to that um, piece of information that they gave yeah. these families, because, and what I have come to realize, and it's the same thing I can relate, you know, sometimes I can be jaded or maybe just biased um, when it comes to say certain refractive surgery procedures, because the ones that I see in our specialty clinic are the yep. junk ones that go wrong. And we're cleaning up the garbage then in those cases when that's actually a very small number of patients relative to the large amount that probably yep. are successful. Guilty. I'm, I'm guilty of that too, right? Yeah. We, we see these train wrecks. That's and right. So we just are like, oh yeah, I would proceed with caution anytime a patient asks about it. Where in reality, you know, these procedures that we see were done 10 years ago mm -hmm. and they were utilized by somebody who probably shouldn't have been doing the surgery. And, you know, that's certainly not the case today. Good, yeah. good point. Yeah. So, yeah. So in communicating my, my kind of kind, gentle um, update to somebody who does have that kind of opinion, it's first and foremost, you know, I can see where you're coming from because I do realize that probably what were your experience, what are your experiences? How many cases have you seen recently in our area? What were those complications? And most of the time I'm finding that when you question it and actually get down to what the real problem was, it ends up being a nice conversation that turns kind of goes away from the device being the issue. And it becomes apparent that it was a solution misuse or patient that had some other thing going on that maybe wasn't a great candidate in the first place. So trying to come from a place that we're not attacking each other is actually been really valuable in um, getting people to listen to each other. So I started off with that in the dialogue of, wow, you know, I can understand exactly where you probably are coming from. Share with me because I want to learn from you. What are the complications that you're seeing and how can I help when it comes to, you know, lecturing that I do or in our practice to avoid giving you any more patients that you have to clean up the garbage for. And then it just is simply a conversation about, well, where you, you know, if you have time, here's, you know, one of the more, I've been meaning to send you an article for a while, just forgotten, but here one is. So, and really making sure that those articles that we choose to share with our peers 
um, are things they can relate to. So I usually try to select if I'm talking to, say, an ophthalmologist, I'll find an article that has evidence base related to that topic. So ortho K or myopia control, and maybe with an MD on the paper too. Somebody who they can relate to things that are have um, uh, kind of a published in a credible journal. We're not talking about a blog that I send them, you know, that nobody's going to, I mean, blogs are great. I use them all the time. There's a lot of valuable information in them, but when it comes to communicating to say an MD, that culture is really centered around evidence base. And so you really have to choose your resources uh, to, according to the audience that you're trying to relate with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about pediatricians. What, how do you get those conversations? I, I, I personally only know one or two pediatricians who my kids see, uh, but that's a great resource to help educate them on the importance of myopia management, particularly as the World Health Organization is coming out with more and more data showing the importance that we do need to make this part of the, you know, the greater medical knowledge with kids and, and, and so forth. So how do you start those conversations and how do you get that ball rolling? In that population in particular, that's even further away from what I've noticed ophthalmology knows about myopia control. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a cold start where it's literally an approach where it's putting out a resource just in general about um, most pediatricians that I know haven't even gone even as far as what the different treatment options could be, let alone contact lenses on kids, unless they do happen to have experiences with them. And so in that population, it's more of a generalized looking at um, hey, here's how you could identify if there's a child that does maybe need these types of services, um, more so than being at the point of, I think the pediatricians are more likely to trust the eye providers, whether it's ophthalmology or optometry and kind of guiding at that point. So it's a broader um, kind of evidence base. So that population, I would share general myopia management papers, what's the value in it? What are the risk factors, that type of thing. Um, and we've actually gotten a lot of referrals yeah. um, going that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, a really key component. And, you know, especially people who are trying to grow their myopia practice, they may want to put something together, go and introduce themselves to pediatric uh, clinics and have a conversation. If there's opportunities to do lunch and learns or those sort of things, I, you know, just recently went and did a lunch and learn with a pediatric ophthalmologist and, you know, shared a little bit of the data and what we see and, um, you know, he's very forward thinking. I mean, a lot of pediatric ophthalmologists are doing something in myopia management. They may not be fitting contact lenses, or they may be having somebody else in their clinic do it. And knowing that there's somebody in the area that that mm -hmm. can take it on and, and, and partner with them. And, you know, I, I don't want to do business surgery, so I need somebody. Right. And, I, you know, um, if there's a, a, a really funky retinal issue, you know, we're going to send that over to them. And so helping them become part of the equation. You also talked about other non eye care providers. Is there somebody else outside of the pediatricians that you automatically think about in uh, in this arena? Teachers. So in this oh, whole system. there's teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's a huge one. And, you know, what you are know, you doing for them? Uh, so it just really, so we have that area as an area in our practice that we're working on growing with uh, newer associates that have the time to start going out into the community. Um, but I, we were doing screenings in schools every so often just to um, kind of, we target the populations that we want. So schools that are in our area for one, and then also schools um, just in areas that, you know, we feel, um, you know, have expressed interest in one way or another in our community um, to have these types of services offered for their kids. Um, and so doing things like that to either even just get messages out, offer at one point we've offered um, webinars and, you know, nights where we can have um, information passed on uh, to the parents that are interested in doing so is um, something that is valuable. We did this in Houston actually too, where we would host at the school um, for schools and for the, you know, university students, things like that, ways to get the information out. Um, and I think it's a huge untapped area, definitely in Calgary, um, for teachers to have access to everybody. And actually, they are one of our first lines when it comes to identifying kids that um, potentially need a vision exam. And we've, we've known that. And so to take it to the next level, that, that group um, is ideal when we're looking at also teaching them beyond the, just needing an eye exam. Um, myopia control is a big area that we really need them on board for as well. 
I have a I have a Canada question. Uh, so in in Canada, there is uh, there is support for children vision to 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 have an eye exam uh, through the government entities. Uh, in the United States, a, a lot of times a teacher doesn't want to bring up a, any type of medical condition because if they do, then it could be upon the school to develop a, a plan that then ends up having to pay for it for the student as opposed to their parents having to pay for it. So it could be that in some in some ways, some schools will not bring up those types of issues or that there could be a resource for that. You know, it, is that something where you struggle with that with teachers or are teachers far more accessible to having children, you know, pointing out, hey, you should go have an eye exam um, to, in, in Canada? More accessible, I would say, because we get that a lot where we will actually have, it's the teacher that initiates the whole thing. And I think that in general, populations everywhere are getting better. I would say Mm -hmm. um, relative to say our generations, there's just a lot more knowledge out there. And in the schools, they do regularly do screenings and all kinds of different things, or at least they're paying attention for it. Um, But I, I wouldn't say there's any accessibility issues, the insurance thing and that kind of whole, I guess, concept is something that I don't face in Canada. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Anything else that we should touch on on the safety and bringing other people into the loop with us that you can think of? You know, Dave, just the biggest message, and I always will get on a soapbox about this, is when it comes to our management strategies, don't don't minimize the risks. Make sure that the education of what is out there is um, is given to families so that we can avoid. Um, education is everything and just passing that all on. I, I just think that in our community, especially as it gets more and more um, standard of care, um, we're seeing in Canada, um, you know, we teach all the time on how to fit ortho K lenses. You and I both, you, I mean, I know you do a lot of education still as much as you have time for in your non-busy schedule. And we are seeing fitter and we want this more fitters for and more people comfortable with fitting uh, myopia control or myopia management, soft lenses, ortho K and a big thing as that population rises, we all have to remember safety because if we slip backwards in time, back to the, you know, I think you said in the seventies where we're starting to see complications because we're complacent with that issue because it's easy to put a lens on an eye. You know, it's, it's very easy to just do that. Yeah. But when it comes to avoiding and managing complications, that takes a little bit of extra training and effort and proper follow-up and, so that would be the only last thing that I would want to, you know, just talk about maybe today. I think we're good on it now, but that's something that's really important for all of us as we're um, upping our game to offer more and more services is to manage that so that we don't burn those bridges with our partners we've worked so hard to develop trusting relationships with. Yeah. Well, you know, we think about the soft spherical world, and that's a that's an instance where we may have become complacent as a profession because, you know, if a, if a lens doesn't fit, just slap another one on. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think we've become far more knowledgeable, uh, even in the last couple of years with uh, AFE and the, the Pacific team's work and sagittal depth, and we can fit these spherical lenses. It's not just throwing something on and trying it. And, uh, you know, fortunately we've got incredibly healthy lenses and, um, but we're sometimes putting them on sick eyes, dry eye individuals, patients with allergies. And, you know, you bring up a really good point that we need, do need to not minimize risks of, is this, you know, serious issue. These are people's eyes and it's their vision and having these education with people who are also on the front line of managing the health of these people. So I I think it's a, a really good reminder uh, for, for, for us all. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Dave in Seattle, this, you just triggered me a little bit with, um, just the mention of dry eye. Um, I know that's been an area that has been your jam for many, many years. And, um, one of the cool topics about, um, fitting contact lenses in kids today, especially with the increase in, I guess, you know, screens and our environment and all the things that play into myopia control as well, that's a whole nother piece that I really noticed. I don't know how you feel in Seattle where it's a lot more humid environment for me coming from different parts of the world. And now back in Calgary, where it's very, very dry um, is something also to consider when we're looking at putting contacts on kids for myopia control. Um, I've found that in our practice, we've had to really pay attention 
to that ocular surface um, as a baseline in the beginning, because I'm finding that if we don't, our orthok kids have more lens adherence, for example, and more dry spots. And we know that that's always a danger zone when it comes to contact lens safety and management. Um, so that's been kind of cool to notice the differences in environment, humid versus dry, and to really pay attention to it. I think every child in North America and you know probably the world is now susceptible to more dry eye um, just because of the visual demands and the types of learning that they do um, using screens and other devices. And uh, it's definitely something that um, probably needs to be yeah. in our myopia management clinics as more of a larger part of it, not a separate part. So dry eye clinic and myopia clinic are not as separate as they maybe once were thought to be. I'm finding we have to merge them together for the best success and to keep that safety level where it should be for the kids that do wear contact lenses. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think it's a good, uh, a good reminder. And, uh, you know, it, it is something that, that makes that safety concern a little bit higher, um, than mm -hmm. maybe it was five years ago. You know, we've had dry eye forever, but it mm -hmm. certainly is the, the prevalence of it in children is, is increasing, worldwide, nationwide, uh, you know, North America wide. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal. And, uh, we're gonna, we may see more complications uh, in children, uh, with contact lens wear as myopia management gains in popularity. And we increase the number of children who are wearing contact lenses, right? We're, as a, as a whole, uh, the contact lens industry has struggled to get children to wear contact lenses and uh, the myopia management group is probably the highest percentage of kids uh, ages six to 10 that are wearing contact lenses. And as we increase and improve upon lens technologies, you know, with the, obviously with orthokeratology, but also in, in the soft lens world, um, we need to figure out what needs to be done for uh, dry eye management of children and I, I, I don't think the management of, of dry eye in kids is the same as the management in adults, right? Any more than a cardiologist that's a pediatric cardiologist is comfortable doing adults and vice versa. So I think that's an avenue that um, really we're going to need to delve into a lot deeper in the coming years and figure out how we address this problem, particularly for kids who are wearing contact lenses or putting an atropine drop in every day, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's just going to affect the ocular surface, especially if you do it for five years. Mm -hmm. So um, some some real big topics here that we need to uh, further get to the bottom of. I appreciate you joining us and hanging out with me today. It was good to have you. Thanks for having me, Dave. I do appreciate it yeah. too. Hopefully it won't be another five years before we can get together again on at least it's a, a podcast is one way to do yeah. it for sure. Yeah, it won't be. We'll, we'll do it sooner. Perfect. Yeah, And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, please like and subscribe and uh, stay tuned for other great episodes. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.